we're going to get started. Okay. Welcome to this edition of IP Video Training. This training is designed to help you empower parents to make mealtime family time. This training is brought to you by Purdue Cooperative Extension and Purdue's Center for Families, Promoting Family Meals Project. Welcome to the family table. My name is Barb Mayfield. I am the director of the Promoting Family Meals Project here at Purdue University. I'm also a member of Indiana's State Nutrition Action Plan. This committee also includes Indiana Cooperative Extension representatives, the Indiana WIC program, the Indiana Department of Education, Indiana State PTA, as well as Purdue Center for Families Promoting Families Meals Project. You may be participating in this training because you are part of WIC, FNEP, or FNP in Indiana, therefore involved in this Indiana State Nutrition Action Plan, otherwise known as SNAP. If not, you are participating in order to learn how to promote family meals for another purpose. This training will apply to you as well. If you are wondering what is SNAP, let me give you a brief overview. It originated in 2003 when the United States Department of Agriculture brought together representatives from nutrition assistance programs such as WIC and food stamps from across the country to identify a common nutrition goal and to formulate a plan to work together to meet that goal. SNAP goals include the promotion of healthy eating and active lifestyles, the promotion of healthy community and school nutrition environments, promoting fruit and vegetable consumption, and promoting breastfeeding. Most states have adopted the first goal, which is the most general, and then done something more specific within it. Indiana selected this goal as well, even though our more specific goal is much more related to fruit and vegetable consumption. Indiana's SNAP goal is to promote family meals to increase fruit and vegetable consumption. A logical question to ask is, why family meals? Why not just promote fruits and vegetables? As we'll discuss in our first section of this video training, there are lots of compelling reasons to promote family meals. Related to the SNAP goal, we know from studies that children who eat with their families eat more fruits and vegetables. They also eat more grains, lean meats, low-fat dairy products. In addition to better eating habits, they have closer family relationships, do better in school, and engage in less risk-taking behaviors. We may want parents to serve their children more fruits and vegetables, but that may not be at the top of a parent's priority list. Higher on a parent's list are having a great relationship with their child and helping their child succeed in life. Health is generally not as strong a motivator. If it were no one would eat fat, sweet desserts or smoke, and everyone would wash their hands diligently. However, promoting healthy behaviors as part of being a good parent is a strong motivator. Parents are much more likely to adopt a positive habit, such as more regular family meals, that has multiple benefits than one that simply promotes healthy eating, like serve your child more fruits and vegetables. We have found when talking to real people that the number one reason that children and their parents value family meals is to be together and connect with one another in a positive way, which is a very strong motivator. Therefore, promoting family meals allows us to promote better diets without mentioning diet at all. 
So whatever your reason for promoting family meals, whether it be to promote fruit and vegetable intake or for any other reason, this training will equip you to meet your goals. Let me give you a brief overview of what the training includes. This training is divided into six video segments, and at the beginning of each one, there'll be a new slide that says that segment, and each one is between 10 and 25 minutes in length, so you'll be able to pause in between the segments if you'd like, and we'll also indicate your study guide and on the computer screen where they're uh, able to be um, seen the uh, number of minutes for each segment. And each segment you can do separately or as a series. And along with the video, we've provided a downloadable study guide for you to take notes on that will help you understand and use the information. And please make sure before you begin segment one that you have a copy printed off. And complete the first section as soon as you're finished watching the introduction. Other tools for teaching and assessment are also available for you to download. And you will want copies of these before the segments in which they are discussed. You can also complete this training by yourself or with a group of others. Discussion questions are included in the study guide that you can think about on your own if you're not doing it with anyone else, and they're called reflection questions. You can also watch these segments by yourself and then get together with a group later and discuss the questions. Let's look at what each of the six video segments are about. <clears throat> The first one examines why we want to promote family meals. Segment two looks at when to talk about family meals. There are many answers to this question. Sometimes you're going to delve right into talking about mealtime. It might even be the primary focus of a group session that you're having called family meals class. Or it could be something brought up in an individual appointment on a fairly routine basis, but in other circumstances, other things will lead to that discussion. In this section, we're going to consider what are teachable moments when the topic of family meals is most appropriate. Often, it will be when obstacles or other issues that are related to, family, to the topic of family meals are really quite appropriate. For instance, we're going to look at some of the troublesome behaviors that are very common uh, concerns of parents, and then look at the powerful role that routine plays in a child's life and how family meals can provide that routine and security. We need to meet parents where they are and address what their concerns are. And in this segment, we're going to discuss how to do that effectively. Segment three will answer the question, what do parents want from family meals? We need to focus on their wants and needs and not on our agenda. This segment will look at the overall goal of helping parents achieve family meals that are easier, more often, and more pleasant. We will look specifically at more targeted goals that parents have, which include finding time for family meals and finding good places to eat together. Other goals many parents have include achieving easy, tasty, and healthy meals and eliminating distractions at mealtime, of which turning off the TV is the most common challenge. We're going to provide strategies as well as ideas for conversation starters to get families talking. And another main goal that families have is to avoid mealtime battles and enjoy mealtimes with their families. Segment four will show you how to talk with parents about mealtime, focusing on strategies for one-on-one -on -one situations like counseling. Segment five will continue this with a focus on how to facilitate group dialogues. You'll see some video clips of a WIC class about family meals, and we'll discuss how a conversation about family meals can be incorporated into other groups you are leading. Segment six will wrap up our series with a look at how to help parents set goals based on stages of change, as well as how to measure behavior change. It is essential that we are able to document our effectiveness and therefore add to the evidence of how family meals benefit families and how they can be effectively promoted and achieved. Let's get started. 
Thank you for joining me in this conversation about mealtime. I hope this time at the family meal table inspires and empowers you to effectively connect with the people you serve and in turn empowers those parents to make mealtime family time. So we'll move on now to segment one. our video train by taking a closer look at why promoting family meals could make all the difference in the world for the health and well-being of the families we serve. More than that, we'll set the stage for why using this approach might be more effective than our traditional promotion of healthy eating behaviors. If you were to draw a picture of a family meal on this chalkboard or write out a definition, what would it be? You have a space on your study guide to do this. Draw a picture or write a sentence or two. If you're not alone, share with one another your definitions or drawings. I'm going to give you one minute to do this. Okay, time's up. Does your picture fit this description? Or did something else come to mind for you? It is so easy to think others eat the way we eat. How often do you think the families of the children in your program eat together like this? Let me share with you why I got interested in family meal time. <clears throat> it started with the realization for that for years I had based my counseling and my teaching on the assumption that families ate together like in that picture. I simply took that event for granted. Now you must realize I have taken literally thousands of food frequencies and 24 hour recalls and recorded types and amounts of foods eaten without in most cases bothering to find out who else was present. Then something changed all that. I started doing home visits as a nutritionist for the First Steps program. That's Indiana's early intervention program. And I made the observation that in many homes, there wasn't even a place designated for eating together. It is so easy to think that others eat the way we do. Wrong. When we were just starting the SNAP project, we wanted to find out how often the families we served experienced family meals. We surveyed nearly 1,200 participants from the WIC Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program and Family Nutrition Program. We found that less than half eat as a family at least once a day. But on a positive note, fewer than 20% eat together rarely or two or fewer times per week. That means about a third of the families eat together about half the time. So what exactly is a family meal? 
Does it only include this idealistic image of two parents and two children sitting around a table with happy smiles and a home-cooked meal? Well, on the front of our Let's Talk About Mealtime handout, we describe family meals like this. A family meal is when the people you live with come together to eat and talk. It can include everyone, or it can be just you and your child. Family meals don't have to be fancy, and they can be eaten at home or away. They are best when you can talk and listen to each other away from the noise of the television. So think about the families in your community. What do you think they would tell you about their family's meals? Do you think they would describe some obstacles to having this type of ideal family meal? What do you think they would claim is their biggest obstacle? I can read your mind. You're absolutely right. The number one obstacle is time. Think about the schedules of children and families in your community between the end of the school day and bedtime. How often in a week are family meals a part of that schedule? Is a meal eaten in a car between activities a good substitute? How about a meal eaten in a concession stand? Is takeout eaten in front of the television just as beneficial as a home-cooked meal around the table? Is it important that people experience family meals? If everyone gets fed, does it really matter how? If less people are having family meals, does that matter? These are reasonable questions to ask because we are no longer eating together as often as we did in times past. In fact, most surveys of American families with children of all ages finds that only about one-third eat together at least once a day. About a third rarely eat together and the other third eat together sporadically. However, if you ask how often families eat slightly less than once a day, about five or six times a week, the percentage does jump to about 50% of families. But this does vary with the life cycle. Take a look at this graph. As a child grows older, the frequency of family meals declines. Each year since 1998, the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University, called CASA for short, has surveyed thousands of teens between the ages of 12 and 17. Notice the steep decline in how many teens have family dinners on a daily basis between the ages of 12 and 17. The number of teens eating with their families every day drops by more than half during this six-year period. Now you might ask, why would the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University be tracking the prevalence of family meals? Well, back in 1996, they made a discovery. They were looking for those things, if any, that differentiated the kids who engaged in destructive behaviors like smoking and drinking and drugs from those that did not. And they examined all kinds of variables accounting for race, class, and ethnicity. And the results surprised them. They found that eating dinner with their families was more predictive of these behaviors than many other things that they had expected, like church attendance or grades in school. Well, why are fewer families, especially during the teen years, eating fewer family meals than in years past? What do they cite as the culprit? This list is no surprise. Conflicting schedules, both parents working, often long work hours and split shifts, too many meetings and kids' practices for sports and music. All of these things lead to fatigue and the feeling that there is not enough time and energy for planned meals. Is there anyone watching who feels like they don't attend enough meetings and they'd like their children to be more scheduled into activities? I don't think so. Also, we are seeing more people with limited skills in food preparation, which leads to a lack of confidence in their ability to get a meal on the table. So even though surveys indicate that the overwhelming majority of parents say they think family meals are important, they aren't having them as often as they'd like. And this, in turn, motivates drive-through eating and microwave dinners in front of the TV, or each family member grabbing what they want and eating it when and where they want. Is this a problem? Well, let's find out. But before we do, I would like for you to reflect on your own experiences with family meals. 
If you're alone, jot down your answers on your study guide. If you're watching with someone else, turn to them and take two minutes to share your own experiences with each other. How are your memories similar or different from your family meals today? Does your past impact what you strive for now? I'm now going to give you two minutes to talk about this. I hope you had time to think and to talk about your own experiences. And as you work with families, it is so important that they share their experiences with family meals because what they say to you should greatly impact the direction that you take with them. But before we consider how we will work with the families we serve, let's consider first why we want to even talk about family meals. Do family meals matter? We'll look at this question from several points of view. The impact of the family meal on social skills and family relationships, academic performance, risk-taking behaviors, and eating habits and weight. We'll see how sharing meals builds stronger, healthier families in many ways. The one thing valued most by both parents and children about family meals is the opportunity to connect with one another. Family meals are a great place to share your daily lives and stay in touch. Children and adolescents who eat family meals together experience improved family communication, have stronger family ties, and a greater sense of identity and belonging. Research on the significance of family routines and rituals considers the family meal a marker for strong, resilient families. Even in alcoholic families, research has shown that if families can manage to eat meals together, maintain that ritual, that children have a much better chance of not becoming alcoholics themselves. It may surprise you that research also shows that children who eat with their families do better in school. There are probably many reasons for this association. But one important finding is that family meals help children learn to speak. A study directed by Dr. Katherine Snow at Harvard's Graduate School of Education followed 65 families over 15 years, looking at how mealtime conversations play a critical role in language acquisition in young children. Mealtime conversations were tape recorded and analyzed. They found that the conversations that occur around the family table teach children more vocabulary and forms of discourse than children learn when you read to them, which is also important to do. Educators know 
that improved vocabularies lead to better readers, and better readers do better in all school subjects. Here are the CASA findings relating grades in school to frequency of family meals. According to their most recent report, teens who have dinner with their families seven times a week are almost 40% more likely to say they receive mostly A's and B's in school compared to teens who have dinner with their families two or fewer times a week. Why is this? We don't know. It is probably for a variety of reasons. Things as simple as discussions about school around the table or the input of parents concerned that homework gets started as soon as supper's over. It would be fascinating to find out that whether families who start eating meals together have children who, whose grades improve. Encourage your families to find this out for themselves. Family meals are a natural training ground for learning social skills, manners, and how to have pleasant conversations. Now, parents may scoff at this thought if their family meals seem like anything but manners are being learned. But tell them, don't dismay. Perfect etiquette isn't the goal. Just an ability to act civil, take turns, be a good listener, and practice the give and take that is needed for getting along with others. Not just around a family table, but in a classroom, on a sports team, and when they're grown up, at work. Think about it. It's at the family table that we learn to talk, learn to behave, learn to share and take turns, be polite, not to interrupt, and when we have guests, how to entertain. Great lessons for success in life. Another major benefit of family meals is the finding that children who eat with their parents are less likely to smoke, drink, take drugs, get into fights, become sexually active, or commit suicide. And we've mentioned some of those before. Those are powerful motivators to parents. We need to encourage family meal, families to start the family meal habit when their children are young and they're not so worried about those things, and then keep it up through the teen years. It's a much harder habit to begin during adolescence. It's a relatively easy habit to begin when they're toddlers. The Family Day slogan, this one says it all, I believe. It is one habit that prevents another. Family Day is an annual event that was started by CASA back in 2001, and it is celebrated every year on the fourth Monday in September. And you can find out more about it at their Family Day website. This shows the TV Land website promoting Family Day. Let's watch Jamie Lee Curtis promote Family Meal Time. Want to protect your kids from drugs and alcohol? Pick up a knife and a fork and a spoon and sit down to dinner together. Because children who eat with their families are less likely to smoke, drink, or use drugs. So join us in making a statement. We want 10 million people to commit to having dinner with their families on Family Day, September 26th. Pledge your time now. Call or go to FamilyTable.info. A message from CASA and the Family Table. Forks on the left, knives and spoons on the right, family all around. Last but not least... Children who eat with their families eat better. A number of researchers, such as Diane Newmark Stainzer and her colleagues at the University of Minnesota, have found a dramatic relationship between family meal patterns and dietary intake. Family meals are associated with improved intakes of fruits, vegetables, grains, calcium-rich foods, protein, iron, fiber, and vitamins A, C, E, B6, and folate. They are also associated with a lower intake of soft drinks. When families eat together, families eat better. Another study, the Feeding Infants and Toddlers study, called FITS for short, found that by 24 months of age, French fries are the most common vegetable consumed by toddlers, with one quarter of all toddlers having fries every day. Now, do you think this is because Orida is selling lots of fries? <clears throat> that these youngsters are eating with their families around the table? Or do you suppose it means lots of young children are eating meals from little boxes or bags that they got at the drive-thru and are dining in car seats 
on the way to and from other activities. Think about that. Now we don't need to bash french fries or fast food, but the finding that 25% of toddlers are having them every day says more than something about food choices. I believe it tells us something about meal times. Why is it family meals impact a child's eating habits and therefore their health? As a child grows, children learn good nutrition and positive eating habits and social skills by the examples that are set or not set by their parents at the family table. We learn to eat by watching others eat. At meals, others can model healthy eating and socialize children into eating like the rest of the family, according to their culture. To think that children would experience healthy eating as well away from the table would be like thinking we could learn to swim without ever getting in a pool. There's something about putting a meal on the table to be shared with others that motivates healthier food choices. Not that it can't happen without a shared meal at the table, it just seems to be less likely. When people are asked to describe a meal, they generally say something like, it has a meat or other protein foods, a starchy food and a vegetable or a salad. When they're asked to describe any other type of eating event, vegetables are rarely if ever mentioned. Interesting. Well, child and adult overweight are huge issues today, and there are many reasons family meals are seen as a potential preventive measure against overweight in children. First, consistent meal times allow children to feel secure that they will be fed. Regular meals prevent grazing and promote coming to the table hungry, but not starving. Family meals, as we said, promote an improved intake of nutrient-dense foods and a reduced intake of nutrient-poor foods. At family meals, parents can role model healthy eating behaviors and a healthy relationship with food and eating. At family meals, eating can be a focused activity. Therefore, hunger and satiety cues can be attended to and respected as opposed to disengaged eating. And lastly, family meals promote a sense of belonging when family members come together and this lowers the risk for loneliness-induced eating for comfort. How can you talk with families? This will be the focus of our remaining segments. But in brief, achieving a positive family meal experience should be a solution to a concern the parent has shared or a means to achieve a goal they've expressed, such as spending quality time with their children. They may not realize the potential of family meals to do this. So begin with building awareness. Provide information in a relaxed environment that allows participants to share their experiences, their barriers, and what their hopes and dreams are for their families. Role model and share your experiences and ones others have found to work. Empathize with how difficult parenting can be, and yet provide encouragement that they can be successful. Help families set realistic goals. Family meals don't need to be complicated. We'll look at the resources you can provide and how you can promote family meals with your families. Let's get started. We're ready now to transition to the next segment.
we know why we should promote family meals. Let's consider how we can do it with the families we serve. This segment looks at when to talk about family meals. Have you ever heard the saying, timing is everything? The time to talk about family meals is when someone is ready. And what causes them to be ready is going to vary greatly. They may not even be aware that they are ready. But you can learn what those teachable moments are that make a parent ready to consider how family meals can meet a need for their family. I hope that watching the first segment on the benefits of family meals got you excited about sharing this information with your families. But we need to make sure we don't go overboard sharing our enthusiasm with them without being sensitive to where they are coming from and what they want and need. First, let's decide when it's appropriate to talk about mealtime. That's a more general term than family meals. It includes any way that children eat meals. Before talking about family meals, you need to find out more about how the family experiences meals, which may or may not be as a family, and then let that lead to a discussion about family meals. There are two triggers of when to talk about mealtime and family meals with parents. The first of these is when the topic of mealtime addresses a concern that the parent has expressed. There are many concerns that are related to mealtime, some obviously related and some not so obviously. We'll look at some of the most common you probably see every day when working with families. Another time to talk about mealtime is when having family meals will help a parent reach a dream they have for themselves such as to be a great parent who feels a measure of control over the, her life, or a dream they have for their child, such as to break free from generational poverty and go to college, or dreams they have for their families, such as getting along and having fun together. The benefits we discussed in the first segment illustrate how family meals can help parents reach these dreams. We'll look at how we can help parents make the connection between having family meals and reaching their dreams. Remember, our overall goal is to empower parents to make meal time, family time. Well, how many of these concerns have you heard from parents? My child is such a picky eater, they won't eat this or they'll only eat that. My child doesn't want to stop and come to the table or as soon as they're at the table they want to get down and do something else. My child just messes around and plays in her food and doesn't want to eat what I give her. I have to beg my child to get him to eat. Or I, I make him what he wants. There are many reasons for these concerns. Children are naturally picky eaters and hesitant to try new things. But all of these concerns are related to mealtime. And talking about mealtime needs to happen to fully address these concerns and problem solve solutions with the parent. This then becomes a teachable moment when the parent is ready to discover something that might make things easier as a parent. In short, if feeding is frustrating to the parent in any way, that's a good time to talk about mealtime because mealtime is when feeding occurs and how it's happening in that family will show you how you can help. If we don't ask the right questions, we might not find out that the child's mealtime is by themselves with just the company of the TV, rather than at the table with the rest of the family. We need to find out if meals are structured or if the child grazes all day. We need to find out whether a parent sits with the child and eats at the same time. All of this makes a difference in how a child eats and how easily a parent can correct problem behaviors. Chances are, if the parent isn't eating with the child at structured meals, they probably don't even realize it's important. If they are having family meals, they're moving in the right direction and acknowledge their success. Parents need affirmation that they're doing right by their child. If their mealtime experience, however, is less than desirable, your discussion can focus on strategies to make mealtimes 
better. Family meals are the stage on which parents can make positive changes in feeding their children. <clears throat> to attempt to correct problem behaviors without the structure of regular family meals will likely lead to failure and more frustration. So when a parent describes a problem behavior, that should lead to a discussion about mealtime, and the first action should be to provide regular family meals, then work on the behaviors. In my experience, providing regular family meals was often all it took to correct problem behaviors. Family meals are the foundation upon which other positive behaviors can be practiced. Provide the context for healthy eating behaviors, and they're much more likely to be successful. Often, when people think of family meals, they set the standard at some ridiculous level. Moms think that if they can't put a pot roast on the table with china and flowers, they aren't having a family meal. They certainly think that if there aren't two parents present, it might not be called a family meal. Let's not forget our definition of a family meal. It can include everyone, or it can be just you and your child. If they're home when they're feeding their child, and I hope they don't leave their children home alone, then they have the opportunity to eat with their child. Eating at the same time and in the same place makes it a family meal. When parents see that having family meals is where they can correct problem behaviors, they're going to be motivated to put forth the effort. But don't promise overnight success. Parenthood requires lots of perseverance and patience. Don't paint a picture like a Norman Rockwell painting. Keep the expectations realistic. Share this simple recipe for family meals with them. The two most important ingredients for family meals are consistency and companionship. Encourage parents to create a mealtime routine that their child can count on. That's consistency. And to make family meals a time for companionship so their child knows they are there for them. The security those two things gives a child is powerful and is what makes family meals especially important to young children. I have a theory that has both scientific evidence and anecdotal evidence to support it, but it is still my theory and hasn't been proven. But please consider with me the role of routine as we consider problem behaviors and the importance of family meal time. Let's take that common complaint of parents with young children, the picky eater, or the child on a food jag who will only eat a few familiar foods. There are a variety of reasons this might occur, but one that I have found to often seem important is that this frustrating behavior is a symptom of what I'll call chaotic life disease. Consider the chaotic lives of some of the children you see. They might have multiple caretakers, live parts of each week with different family members. They might get woken early in the morning to get to daycare and their sleep is disrupted. They might not get a nap one day, but get one the next. Meals might be hit or miss, eaten in the car or at all different times. Does this make for a strong sense of security? When your life gets crazy and chaotic, do you often reach for what you could consider a comfort food? Are those comfort foods might be something you'd call safe and familiar, not new and exotic? If a child isn't forcing structure and familiarity into their chaotic world by only eating the same foods, they might be exhibiting this in other ways. So ask the parent whether they want to wear the same outfit over and over or read the same book every night before bed or always sleep with the same stuffed animal. Children need consistency. If it isn't a part of their lives, they'll try to get it any way they can. So ask parents about routines or if their lives are more chaotic. Then strategize with them ways that they can create more routine, such as regular naps and bedtime, rituals before bed, in addition to regular meals and snacks. 
Parents will often say that their child eats better at childcare. Well, you know, this may be because of several factors, one being the highly structured routine of most childcare settings. Second is hopefully the positive eating environment and the positive role modeling of caring adults that are there. I have often prescribed family meal routines when food jags were an issue, and miraculously, the food jags disappeared. Well, enough about the negative. It's much more fun to focus on the positive. Parents have dreams for their children and their families. What parent doesn't want to be a good parent? Catch them doing something right as you're talking with them and tell them what you're seeing. For example, are you working with parents who are trying to go back to school or learn a new skill? Tell them how proud you are of them and how proud their child will be. Encourage them to talk about how important working hard at school or their new job is when they're with their child at the family table. Encourage them to role model the positive behaviors they want to see in their children, even something as simple as eating their vegetables. Children are smart, and you can surely catch their child doing something that demonstrates how smart they are when you're together with the family. That can lead to a comment about how much impact parents have in their child's success, such as, did you know that something as simple as just eating together with your child teaches them words and helps them do better in school? Did you know that when you eat with your kids, they're less likely to do drugs? I have found that statements like these are huge motivators to have family meals. Do parents want less stress? You bet. Family meals can seem like a lot of work. You can help them realize they don't have to be and give them lots of ideas for making them easier. One important message is to get the whole family involved in putting meals on the table. Children thrive on the comfort of being able to count on this regular time with their parents. When family meals go well, parents thrive on the feeling that they have nourished their families not only with good food, but with time together to laugh and share their lives. So when is the right time to talk about mealtime? Anytime you talk about feeding children. This happens at individual appointments, when you're counseling one-on-one. -on -one. We might just get the conversation started and continue it at a follow-up appointment or inviting them to a group session. Group sessions can focus on family meals, but family meals can also be incorporated into any group session that discusses parenting, feeding children, or food shopping and preparation. Now that you know when to talk about family meals, the remaining segments will cover what parents want to talk about and then how to do this. So, it'll be time for our next segment. This segment, number three, will answer the question, what do parents want from family meals? In the same way that what leads to a discussion about family meals is as individual as each parent and family, what they want their family's meals to be is also unique. It is therefore critical that we focus on their wants and needs and not on our agenda. For several years now, I have been presenting to national, state, and local meetings about the importance of family meals. At the conclusion of most presentations, I survey the audience, and amongst other questions, I ask them this. Why do people value family meals? What do you think? Why do you value family meals? The number one reason people give is this concept of family togetherness. This slide gives the results from the first seven conferences that we tally data from. At four conferences, there wasn't anyone who listed something other than this reason of family togetherness. It was only at a conference that was made up of dietitians that 10% of the participants listed improving diets 
as the most important reason to value family meals. We've done a lot of surveying of families to find out what they want family meals to be. What parents tell us is that they want family meals to be a time for sharing good food, laughter, and love, and that they would like their family's meals to be easier, more often, and more pleasant. As you can see, we made these findings front and center on, our, on the cover of our Let's Talk About Mealtime handout, along with the definition of a family meal. You may have identified some of these barriers when you talked about their concerns. As we'll discuss in the next segment, dig deeper to discover anything that is standing in the way of them reaching their goals for their family. As we mentioned in our first segment, time is the biggest barrier parents struggle with. In addition to time, there are some parents who don't have a place to easily get their family together for meals. So this becomes a major barrier. Getting a meal put together is another challenge, which can be due to a lack of skills or planning or both. Lastly, distractions and mealtime battles with their kids are barriers to making family meals pleasant. Instead of dwelling on these barriers, reframe them as what parents want from their family meals. So, since parents don't have time, we can assume if they want family meals, they want to find time for them to happen. Helping parents achieve this goal could have a positive ripple effect that could ultimately transform their lives. People who are most successful are able to control their schedules and follow through on their plans. To be able to plan times to eat as a family is one step in achieving this. Therefore, don't set the sights too high. Families who never eat together need to begin with just once or twice a week. Remind them that if they are the one feeding their child at any time during the week, that's an opportunity to eat with them, and voila, you have a family meal. When talking about mealtime, one barrier parents perceive is that family meals are too time consuming. This isn't true. Family meals can take a long time if you want them to, but they certainly don't have to. I've created a handout titled Fast Food for Busy Families to disprove this myth. In addition to showing how little time they take when compared to getting fast food or carry out, I also compare prices and show how family meals are a much better value. You should have downloaded this for yourself to look at, and I also have it on the slide, so take a look at it with me. The handout has them compare a home-cooked meal with the two most common alternatives, a fast food drive through and carry-out. Now, obviously, all three of these has the potential for being a family meal. All it takes is the family coming together to eat the food wherever it came from. Each of the times listed in the three different scenarios is based on average distances and 2007 prices. The fast food drive through option takes about 20 to 25 minutes to get your food back to your house and will cost about $15 if you choose pretty inexpensive options. Our carry-out example is Pizza Hut, which promises your pizza to be ready to be picked up in 20 minutes. If you live just five minutes away, you can have it on the table in about the same amount of time as your fast food meal and about the same price. So we don't have a clear winner yet. But the winner is the home-cooked meal, which in this instance is spaghetti with meat sauce, a tossed green salad with dressing, toasted garlic bread, and milk. In the same time it takes to get a fast food meal or carry out and bring it home, you can boil water, which takes about 15 minutes, cook pasta, 10 minutes, and while that's cooking, brown a pound of ground beef, add a jar of pasta sauce, and heat through. Frozen sliced garlic bread heats in five minutes in the oven. A bag of prepared mixed greens from your grocer's produce section makes a quick salad. Set the table, pour everyone a glass of milk, and enjoy. 
The cost of $7.85 to feed four to six people was based on purchasing generic brands at a -a Save-A-Lot grocery store in 2007. Now, that even included some convenience items, so you could make that meal cheaper, but at these prices compared to the other meals, you could even buy dessert. We'll talk more in a few minutes about putting meals on the table, but don't let time be an excuse for never making a home-cooked meal. Another barrier we have found is families that don't have a good location to eat with their child. We found that families without tables or enough chairs or, or a table that's loaded down with other things so they're not available for eating. So if a parent doesn't have a good location to eat with their child, help them find a good place. This might be a coffee table or sitting on the floor on a blanket. A table that is loaded down with papers and junk might just simply need to be cleaned off. If they don't have a table or don't have enough chairs, they might look in garage sale ads. Card tables work fine for up to four people. If families are in the habit of driving through a fast food restaurant and then eating in the car, encourage them to make it a family meal by going inside and sitting at a table at the restaurant. Hopefully, they can eventually eat more family meals at home in a place made for eating together. But start where they are and work toward that goal. A table serves to slow down the meal and provides a setting where family meal members can connect over the meal. Let me share a story of something that brought home to me this role of the table in promoting family meals. And it inadvertently promoted family style eating in our whole school corporation at our high school. Now as many schools do, our sports teams have team meals before games. Sometimes it's the day of the game, sometimes it's the day before. Well, as the mother of three, I fixed lots of team meals. Some were eaten at school and some were eaten on buses. And a year ago, we had a German exchange student and Yannick played on our high school basketball team. Well, that team had a tradition of having team meals in the family's homes of the team members. They had them on a rotating basis the night before each home game. Well, when it was our turn to host the meal, I hadn't yet helped with any other meal at someone else's house, so I really didn't know what the protocol was, how they usually did it, so I just did it the way it seemed right for me. And if I'm going to host 25 people for dinner, I'm going to access every available space in our downstairs and set up tables. It didn't really occur to me to have the meal eaten any other way. So here I have a picture of the team eating lasagna spread out all over our house. Whoops, did we go backwards? Oh, there we go. I went too far ahead. This is early January of 2006. The team had a great time. And they even stayed around to play catchphrase and some other games that were under the Christmas tree, which was still set up. I didn't think this was anything unusual until the two moms who had volunteered to come help me serve and clean up commented that they'd never seen the boys stay and relax and enjoy eating so much. What was the difference? The tables. In every other team meal, the food was set up buffet style, and the boys sat wherever they could find space, holding their plates on their laps. And when they were finished, they left. The mother said sometimes the team would swoop in, eight, and be gone within minutes. Well, many of these boys were in our home for a couple of hours. And it led to some very interesting discussions with mothers during subsequent basketball games about taking the time to eat and talk as a family. Parents get a lot of satisfaction from fixing a meal that their families rave over. But most parents are looking for that task of preparing meals to be easier. Helping them with this is what we are really good at. We have tons of ideas for meal planning, shopping, and cooking that we can share with our families. In group sessions, parents can share their ideas for easy, healthy, and tasty meals with each other. A parent who has very limited food preparation skills needs really easy recipes 
or healthy ideas for using convenience foods. If you can do a do food demonstration, that is the perfect way to show just how easy it can be to put a family meal on the table. Let's look at some basic strategies for making family meals. First, plan ahead. Meal planning is not commonly done, but it can be learned, and once put into practice makes all the difference in the world. People can learn how to shop in advance and have food on hand that can be prepared in the time they have available. Families can learn how to use convenience foods wisely. And as we saw with our fast food for busy families handout, something as simple as a packaged salad, pasta, and pasta sauce takes little time to get on the table. Crock pots and microwave ovens are two appliances most families own, and those make family meals easier. In addition to all the recipes that you share with them, the internet is a great resource. More and more families have access to the internet, and so that can be a source for them to find easy, healthy, tasty meals. The USDA website specifically has recipes for the Thrifty Food Plan. The uh, Food Stamp website now has recipes available. Lots and lots of places for them to find recipes. And a family meal is truly a family event if the whole family is involved. Mothers still do the majority of the work involved in getting a meal on the table. Encourage families to share this responsibility. Getting kids into the kitchen and helping cook, set the table, and clean up are tremendous life skills. The next thing that we want to look at is the mealtime environment. Remember, parents are looking for family meals that are pleasant. This family appears to be sharing food, but are they sharing conversation? What is it that distracts family members from each other? Actually, it isn't cell phones, although I wonder if they're not a major distraction in some families. For how many people today is this what a family meal means? How does television impact meals? If this is what the family defines as a family meal, does it matter? How common is that type of family meal? The Kaiser Family Foundation recently completed a study of the use of electronic media in the lives of infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and their parents. They found that watching TV while eating meals is commonplace among young children. In fact, for 30% of children six years and under, TV is always or almost always on during meals. An additional 12% watch television during half of all meals. In fact, they found that on any given day, over half of all children eat at least one snack or meal in front of the television. Well, how do we compare? Our initial survey for our SNAP project had similar findings. We had fewer families than the Kaiser Foundation saying that TV was always or on most of the time. We had more families in the middle and fewer saying rarely or never. Clearly, having the television on during meals is extremely common. Well, what difference does TV make, whether it's on during meals? In a study by Katherine Kuhn and her colleagues at Tufts University in Boston, they found that TV viewing during meals does make a difference. It's more common in households with lower incomes, less educated mothers, or single parents. And it's associated with a higher intake of foods that we would associate with television. Pizza, salty snacks, and soft drinks. And a lower intake of fruits and vegetables. The Kaiser Family Foundation report has many very interesting statistics about young children and TV that I believe we should be aware of. For one thing, almost every child under the age of six lives in a home with a television. And these children under six watch over two hours of TV or video every day. In fact, 43% of children between the ages of four and six have their own TV in their room. And when asked about how parents felt about TV, the parents really had a very positive attitude. They used the TV to get things done without their kids underfoot and, and felt like it was a good thing for them to be doing. The TV is teaching their children. Shouldn't be surprising to find out that the parents who watch the most television have children who watch a lot of TV. And more TV viewing is associated with a higher degree of child overweight. 
Well, for many of the families that we work with, getting families to come together to eat without the distraction of the television will be our primary goal. So help families focus on each other. Help them decide to turn off the TV and the radio and avoid answering the phone. This won't be easy if they have the TV on all the time. They might need not even consider having it off ever. However, when the TV becomes the focus rather than the family, nutrition and other benefits of family meals go down. So motivate families to turn off the set and talk to one another. It is so important that this desire comes from the parent. After you have had them reflect on a desire to talk and share and connect with their families. Families who are used to not talking may need some help to get started and to learn how they can keep the atmosphere positive and involve everyone in the conversation. Well, there are several resources and websites you can access for conversation starters and other ideas to improve the atmosphere at the table. This shows a placemat with conversation starters from the Other White Meat website or directly at their family meal website, which is togetherfordinner.com. Here are examples of the conversation cards available from the University of Washington and the WIC program in Washington State. I think these could get some very interesting discussions going, like what kind of food do you think would describe you and why? Another family favorite is called High Low, in which everyone at the table tells about the high point of their day and the low point. And once families get used to talking, they won't need these. Many of the concerns parents raise about mealtime are related to battles over food with their children, whether it be picky eating and the tendency to short order cook or some other troublesome behavior. If the number one reason family meals are valued is to be together, it should be a time to enjoy being together. To prevent mealtime battles, the best weapon is to give parents a battle plan. And the best one we can offer them is the Division of Responsibility from Ellen Satter. At her website, you can download very useful handouts describing her Division of Responsibility in Feeding, which for parents she has named her Golden Rule for Feeding. The overarching parent's job is to trust that children will do their jobs with eating if they do their jobs with feeding. Most of you are probably very familiar with this philosophy, but let's review it quickly. For children to eat well, parents must feed well. Parents must choose and prepare food that is developmentally appropriate for their children. They must provide a regular schedule of meals and snacks with about two and a half to three hours between each eating time. In between those times, there are no food or beverage handouts, only water. That's why the planned snack is so important. And by snack, I do not mean treat, I mean mini meal. Parents are in charge of the emotional climate at mealtimes. They make mealtimes pleasant, mostly by eating with their child, not just feeding. Turning off the TV and talking to their children are also important. Parents also keep mealtimes pleasant by not pressuring the child to eat certain things or eat in certain amounts of this before that. And parents are important role models for their children. Over time, children will learn to eat what their parents eat and learn to behave at the table in the way their parents expect them to behave. Feeding in this way allows children's inborn capabilities to emerge. Children will eat. Even the sickest baby has within him the drive to survive. Children will tire of even their favorite foods and learn to eat a variety as long as they are offered a variety. Children are excellent regulators. They can stop in the middle of a bowl of chocolate ice cream. How many of us can do that? Children will eat the right amounts to grow in line with their genetic endowment as long as they have the support of their parents to do so. In other words, as long as parents are doing their jobs with feeding, children will do their jobs with eating. And children get better with eating, just as they do with everything else. Family meals allow for these capabilities to emerge and develop. Not having family meals will hamper these from occurring. Well, now we're going to watch about a minute and a half of a video produced by the Kentucky WIC program.
The clip we are going to watch is an interaction between a WIC mom named Sonia and her son Thomas. You decide how well the division of responsibility is honored, as well as other eating and activity habits you see. Feel free to jot down your observations in your study guide. How about some broccoli? We don't have none. We don't have much ranch dressing. Parents sometimes will tell me their kids get in their refrigerator and, you know, get what they want. What do you want then? Peanut butter and jelly? Is that what you said you wanted? No, why is that I want some? A hamburger. We don't have no hamburgers. The kids are the ones who are deciding what they're what they're going to eat, when they're going to eat it, and, and um, the parents just let them have it. You have to eat the sandwich first. I don't tell him no a lot of times. I mean, we usually basically get him what he wants. And then, then you can have that. That's a trade, all right? Uh-huh. Okay. Go eat the sandwich. If he's not going to eat that bologna and cheese sandwich, then that means I'm going to have to get something that he's going to eat so that he does have something in his stomach. Thomas, do you want these chips? Mm-hmm. Here. Here you go. Thanks. You're welcome. So it's, it's a big reward, I think, and kids look, learn uh, food as a reward rather than nutrition sometimes. Here are the questions in your study guide. If you're with others, you could take some time to discuss your answers. You could possibly even pause the tape. What were some of the clues that Thomas was doing some of his mother's jobs in feeding? Who was choosing the food? Thomas, whose job is that? Wasn't it interesting that what he requested, broccoli and a hamburger, would have been in many ways a healthier lunch than what he ended up with. How regular and structured do you think his meals and snacks are based on what you observed? Could Sonia have role modeled positive eating behaviors in the way that she fed him where he was in his bedroom? What do you think of her comment about you have to eat this and then you can have that as a treat? Wouldn't you agree that's pretty common practice? Or this one, if he's not going to eat that bologna and cheese sandwich, I have to get him something to eat so he has something in his stomach. What did you think of his eating environment? One of the things that I think about whenever I watch this video is that that mother is genuinely doing what she believes is best parenting. After all, she's allowing a camera crew to come in and videotape her and her child. This wasn't scripted, and she wasn't told to do the wrong things. So teaching mothers like Sonia the right way to feed their child goes way beyond telling them what foods to serve. Parents want family meals. Can you put it on the slide? There we go. Parents want family meals to be possible in their families by finding time and places for them to occur. They want to have great food shared by the people they love in an environment that builds great memories. Let's help them achieve these goals. Let's find out how. We're ready for the next segment.
This segment will show you how to talk with parents about mealtime. We're going to focus on strategies for one-on-one -on -one situations like counseling. We'll save facilitated group dialogues for the next segment. We'll do some role playing for you and encourage you to do some role playing if you're participating with someone else. Practice these techniques as soon as possible in a real life situation to get comfortable with talking about family meals. Your participants struggle with finding the time, energy, and meal management skills necessary to make family meal time easy and successful. Our goal is to learn how to engage in dialogue with them about their experiences, challenges, and desires for making family meals a reality. You know the benefits of eating together. How can you help them discover these benefits and appreciate what they might mean for their families? Let's learn how you can strategize with families and help them solve problems and set goals. We want to empower parents to make their families' meals healthier, happier, and happen more often. How can you talk with families? We're ready to really practice this now. Let's review our key points. Achieving a positive family meal experience should be a solution to a concern they have shared or a means to achieve a goal they've expressed. So we need to engage in conversation that allows them to share their experiences, barriers, and what their hopes and dreams are for their families. They may not realize the potential of family meals to address their concerns and dreams. So begin by building awareness if needed. Provide information in a relaxed environment that addresses what they want and need. Role model and share your experiences and ones others have found to work. Empathize with how difficult parenting can be and yet provide encouragement that they can be successful. Help families set realistic goals. As we've said, family meals don't need to be complicated. Provide them with just the resources they need to meet their goals. You don't need to give them everything you have available. Just how do you encourage parents to talk with you in such a way that they share fully and honestly with you, rather than just tell you what they think that you want to hear? How do you dialogue in a way that creates awareness for both you and the parent? Awareness that allows problem solving to occur. Problem solving by the parent and not so much by you. How can you guide parents to select action steps to take? to reach outcomes and goals they have selected that fit within their values. This is my easy to remember mantra for effective counseling. We can make a difference in people's lives if we do three things. Like them, listen to them, and like the way. Write that in your study guide, three L's. Like, listen, like the way. I know you won't remember everything we cover in this session, so I want to simplify my message in a way that will help you put all the details into one memorable idea that will hope, hopefully stick with you. Here is one of my favorite quotes. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Write that down on the line provided in your study guide. This quote summarizes, I believe, two characteristics that make us effective nutrition educators. Number one is to show you really care about the participant, and number two is to show you really care about what you're talking about. I'm concerned that we live in a world that is becoming increasingly impersonal. We bank from ATM machines that think of us as coded cards and numbers. We drive up to restaurants and order a number three, please, from a speaking box, and then barely acknowledge the arm that hands us our meal. We call a business on the phone and receive directions from an automated system telling us which buttons to push to receive the information that we need. Dare to be different. I encourage you to become a little more high touch in our high tech world. This begins with the overall attitude we convey from the moment someone steps through our doors or we step through theirs including our verbal and nonverbal communication, and even the environment of our workplaces. All together they should say, welcome, 
I'm so glad you're here. You matter to me. Is the setting where you provide services warm and inviting? If not, consider how it could be changed. But remember, people are the most important part of your atmosphere, and it costs you nothing to change your attitude from grumpy to welcoming. Some of the most basic ways we can show people we care take no training whatsoever, but are possibly the most effective. First of all, smile. Try it with me now. Give an authentic smile and make eye contact. Smile with your eyes as well as your mouth. Now, doesn't that feel good? Second, call people by name. Do people like to be called by name? Yes. Do they like it when you talk to their children and call them by name and compliment them? Yes. Give people your attention. We humans need to be valued. It is why children clamor for our attention, even if it's for negative attention. Treat everyone you work with as if they had a sign on their foreheads that read, Do I Matter? Let's pause and consider whether one of these simple ideas is one you could try. Smiling more, calling people by name, or thinking that they have a sign on their forehead, Do I Matter? Giving people that positive attention. If so, write it down in your study guide. You could even put one of those phrases on your computer or someplace you'd see it when you're working with people. You're going to get burned out if all you do is give the same old information over and over again like a nutrition education robot. However, if you go into each encounter with a participant, focusing on them as a unique individual, you will really avoid the burnout that doing the same old, same old day in and day out gives you. No two counseling or group sessions should be identical. We may cover much of the same material, but uniquely package it for each individual based on their needs. This requires a little effort and definitely a willingness to ask some questions. And then listen long enough to hear what our clients have to say. So I know what you're thinking. We don't have time to get to know the participant and find out what their concerns are. We have so much data we're required to collect. And we have to cover all this required stuff with them that they need to know, right? Not exactly. Do you want to know a secret? They already know a lot of what you're going to tell them. And secondly, if we overwhelm them with that information, they won't remember a lot of it anyway. One way we can show someone we care about them is to listen to them. If we truly believe the client is our best resource on their problems and the solutions to those problems, we must listen to them. We are often terrible at this. We tend to be much better at talking than we are at give, and giving advice than we are at listening. And not just listening with our ears, but using our eyes as well to pick up on their body language. If you listen to them, I guarantee that they will be more likely to listen to you. People who are allowed to talk about their problems to someone who is a good listener will often solve those problems on their own. Under listen to them in your study guide, write, ask open-ended questions. And this approach works in all kinds of situations to elicit the client's concerns. You can ask a parent, tell me about mealtime at your house. Ask these questions in a non-judgmental way that doesn't bias your client's answers by making them think you are looking for a particular answer. A fun way to phrase this question might be to say, if I was a fly on your wall at your house during meals, what would I see in here? After you ask a question, give them time to respond. Don't rush them. Listen. Really listen. Remember, you have two ears but only one tongue, which is a gentle hint that you should listen more than you talk. Getting people to be open about their concerns requires us to have an attitude of genuine warmth and caring, just like you've written on your study guide. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Demonstrate empathy and understanding, especially when someone is stressed or tired, which is most of the people we see. And before you jump into providing information, affirm that you understand the feelings they've expressed. There are many ways 
that we can affirm their feelings. A head nod, a smile, paraphrasing back to them what they've told you to confirm that you heard them and understand. Saying things like, that must be really tough. Once you've found out the participants' concerns, you've found a starting point for your discussion that's going to meet their needs. And if, you, and if they perceive your, what you're providing is focused on their needs, they'll be motivated and listening. But before providing information, consider what the client is doing right, if anything, and praise the positive. This may be hard for some of us. After all, we have a tendency to focus on the negative. But people by nature do not respond as well to being told what they're doing wrong as they do to what they're doing right. Start by catching them doing something right and praising them for it. At the least, praise them for seeking your help, or at least for being there. A complaint I often hear from staff is that clients are disinterested. If the client doesn't seem interested, ask yourself, am I focused on their concerns? Are they feeling cared about and listened to? Am I convincing the client that I care about what I'm teaching them? Remember, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Our role as nutrition counselors is not to tell the client what to do, but using what we know, help them explore the possibilities. We know things that they don't know about nutrition and lifestyle changes that could benefit their families. If we share those possibilities with them as opportunities to solve their problems and meet their goals, we empower them to make changes. Do you prefer to be told what to do or to be presented with options, then allowed to select the approaches that fit your values and lifestyle? Our role is to light the way. Think of it as shining a flashlight into the darkness. The darkness for them might be a picky eater who is a source of frustration at every meal. The light you provide might be learning the division of responsibility in feeding and eating and helping them select specific strategies for putting it into practice. Our ultimate objective is to help empower clients to set and meet goals. Before someone can set goals, they need to identify what they value, what is important to them. What you share with them regarding nutrition and health will be appreciated when it matches a parent's values. Some common values parents share are listed in your study guide. Would you agree that parents want happy, smart kids to be seen as experts about their children, to be seen as doing things in their child's best interest, and for parenting to be easier? Do you agree with those statements? Parents want to have a good relationship with their children. However, this goal sometimes leads parents to not set appropriate limits because they think that will upset the child. Well, you can light the way for parents when you help them see that limits and boundaries help children feel secure when they are established lovingly and consistently. Parents want to be good parents. They want strong families, and they want to get better at parenting. These values are fairly cross-cultural, even though they might be defined somewhat differently in different families. Build on these core values. Identify what the parent is doing well that helps them meet their goals. Even if you simply acknowledge that their desire to achieve these goals is a positive. Parents value being good at parenting. Show them what they are doing well. When we light the way with parents, rather than simply tell them what we do, we are matching what we offer to not only their values, but their barriers. And our suggestions should be positive, personal, and practical. And we let them set their own goals and pick their own action steps. Adults decide what is important to them, not us. This is based not only on their values and priorities, but also is certainly influenced by their current situation in life. When you're raising young children, you aren't as interested in information about teenagers and retirement. Get to know what is important to your parents and tie your messages to what they value. Adults 
have past experiences that can serve as either barriers or motivators. If they have always gotten this face when they offer vegetables, they're going to need some convincing to try something new. On the other hand, if they have some great memories of family meals being enjoyable, they will be motivated to do it even more. It is our job to help them identify and overcome barriers, as well as recognize what motivates them. Adults are able to serve as a resource. In other words, consider them to be the experts about themselves. You might be the expert about something that can benefit them, but view them as knowing themselves best, because they do. There are three women on this slide. Can you tell their stories? No. Can they? Yes. Discover that, and you have the basis for what you need to teach. Adults act on their own decisions. Provide them with the knowledge they need to solve their own problems, set their own goals, and select the steps that will best fit their lives to reach their goals. Your study guide outlines the why and how of creating conversations with families, including how to initiate the conversation and how to keep it going. Let's look at each of these a little more closely. The English word communication comes from the Latin word communis, which means common. We cannot communicate with someone until we establish common ground with them. I cannot emphasize enough on this first point of building relationships, the importance of building rapport, of being friendly and warm, and acting like you genuinely like the person. If they perceive that you do not like them, don't approve of them, or really would rather not be entering into a conversation with them, they will shut down and you won't accomplish anything. And these conversations have much we want to accomplish. These conversations allow us to identify the concerns or needs that fuel the decisions that clients make. You can identify motivators and barriers. And once trust is established, you can assist parents in problem solving and in setting goals. As you decide how to phrase the questions you want to ask, pay attention to the list in your study guide. Ask open-ended questions. These are questions that can't be answered by a yes or a no. Listen more than you speak, with eyes as well as ears. Keep your body language open and receptive as opposed to closed and judgmental. You will become aware of the questions that are hard to ask, and sometimes you will have to work through your own discomforts. Discover the words and phrases that are most comfortable for you. Stay away from jargon. For example, people eat. They don't consume. Talk naturally so it feels like a conversation and less like an interview. The study guide lists examples of questions that can get the conversation started. Try these questions out and adapt them so they work well for you. If you're watching with someone, you can pause the tape and try out asking an initiating question from the list with each other. Well, as you probably noticed, Angie came up and sat next to me, and we're going to see how this looks in a conversation with Angie. Angie, all parents have struggles with feeding their kids and mealtime. What is concerning you most right now about Ariel's eating? Well, I wish that she would eat meat, but she's having a hard time with textures of meat, and it's really hard for me to get her to eat meat, and I know she should eat meat, but she's having a hard time with that. And so that just sounds really frustrating to you. It is. And, you know, I get all the pressures from, from grandparents and everybody about she should be eating more meat, and I know she should, but it's just frustrating. So you're in a conflict between what you think that she should have and what she's able to do. Yeah. Well, we'll explore that a little further. Okay. That's all we needed to look at. I hope that you saw that I was able to listen to her, let her share with what she had, and ask her a little bit about how that made her feel, that she was frustrated. And we can acknowledge that many parents feel that way. Well, the study guide also offers ideas for progressive questioning, which keeps the conversation alive and flowing. 
These include questions that ask for more details, questions that elicit feelings, questions that get the parent thinking about what an observation means, and questions that ask the parents to consider how they might incorporate changes. There are also questions for helping parents explore some of the barriers they may have that get in the way of positive behavior changes. Often, just asking a question and letting someone think about it is the first step toward a positive change in behavior. What kinds of questions are each of these? Number one, tell me about meals at your house, is an initiating question. Number two, what would you like to be different about your family's meals, is a follow-up to an initiating question about concerns the parents have. It gets the parents to verbalize what they would like their desired outcome to be, rather than just state the problem. The questions on the front of the handout regarding family meals being easier or more pleasant are related to this more general question. Number three, what would it take to incorporate eating together into your family routine? This is an example of progressive questioning that has the parent make a decision about actions they could take to meet a goal. The second page of the Let's Talk About Mealtime handout focuses on benefits. We've condensed a lot of information into half a sheet of paper. Let's take a look at how you might use it in a counseling situation. Angie, I am so proud of you for making an effort to have Ariel there at your family's meals. She's still so young and just being there together with you and her dad means a lot. You know, it probably might be a little easier just to feed her separately, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> but she is getting so much out of it, isn't she? She is, and it's fun to have all of us together, but sometimes I think, oh, it's just so much easier to put her in a high chair and me sit in front of her and, and just feed her, but it's enjoyable for all three of us to be at the table together. And, you know, that, what you said, is what the benefit that most parents value the most. Looking at these other benefits, have you heard of these other uh, benefits of having family meals together? No, I didn't know that it would make her stronger or smarter, that's for sure. <laughs> well, which one do you think is most important to you? Do you think it's the closeness, the family time, or? Yeah, I think that's important. I think the healthier one is important as well. Obviously, I want her to be healthy. You're a good parent, Thank and you. having those family meals is going a long way towards accomplishing that. Great. See how easy that is to motivate with benefits. The third page of the Let's Talk About Mealtime handout lists five primary goals we discussed in the last segment that address the most common barriers to family meals, which are scheduling, location, preparation, distractions, and mealtime battles. If you've had an open and honest conversation about the family's meals and probed adequately, you should both be aware of what is not going well and how the family would like to change. We'll continue with how to help people set goals in our final segment. But before we do that, we're going to examine how we can talk to parents in a group setting. Okay, let me give Dave a call real quick, and then I'll let you know when to begin. Sounds good. Thank you. We'll get started here in just a sec. This fifth segment will continue our discussion about talking with parents, this time focusing on how to facilitate group dialogues. 
you'll see some video clips of a WIC class about family meals, and we'll walk through an entire plan for a group discussion about family meals, as well as discuss how a conversation about family meals can be incorporated into other groups that you're leading. What is a dialogue? It is a conversation. Dialogue learning implies an interaction between teacher and student, rather than teaching like in a typical lecture approach. It involves a conversation that has both parties talking and listening. I'm going to be sharing with you the four overriding principles of dialogue learning and then describe the four parts of a learning task. Then you're going to try putting them into practice. Dialogue learning takes place in a warm, welcoming environment that conveys the message that you're glad they are there and everything is ready and you're looking forward to spending this time together. Kind of like hosting a get-together for friends. Greet them as they arrive, welcoming latecomers and bringing them up to speed as appropriate, allowing for the level of participation each person is comfortable with, and being patient for responses to questions. Meaningful learning occurs when the learner can connect new information to what they already know. If we know that adults have prior experiences and are the experts on themselves, this activation of what they already know will stimulate learning of your new material much more effectively. Warm-up activities and icebreakers related to the topic can accomplish this task. The Massachusetts WIC program has created some very useful resources for group sessions that are available at a website I've referenced in your study guide, Touching Hearts, Touching Minds. Well, one of their icebreaker ideas goes like this. Put your finger and your thumb about this far apart and touch your nose. All right, how many of you are touching your nose? And how many of you are touching your ear like me? How often do you think our children follow what they see us do more than what we say? This is a very effective icebreaker about role modeling. It could lead to a discussion of ways our children imitate us, and parents could share their stories. Other icebreaker ideas include passing around a basket or a bowl with paint chips, and having each participant pick out the one that they think represents how their child eats, or how they feel about, and you fill in the blank. Or you could pass around pictures of people's faces for that same purpose as a prompt. As with all audiences, using a variety of teaching approaches is essential for reaching different learning styles. Incorporate verbal, visual, hands-on, experiential, movement, and more in your group dialogues. Dialogue learning uses open questions for reflection and integration, which seeks to give the information personal relevance. We've looked at how sharing meals build stronger, healthier families in many ways. What do these benefits mean to you? More examples of open questions are listed in your study guide. How would that work in practice? What do you think of? Tell us what is important to you. What information do you need to make this more clear? Describe an example. Why do you think this is so? A key principle when asking open questions is to give plenty of time to reflect and respond and to affirm all answers. These are generally questions that don't have right or wrong answers. Be a good listener and be respectful. Using partner or group interactions is a great way to get people talking, everyone talking, not just the people who are always talking in a group. It is also the best method to get people to make personal meaning of the new information. Dialogue learning utilizes what are called learning tasks. A learning task accomplishes one or more of the following four things. Anchor, it grounds the topic in the learner's life. Add, it provides new information. Apply, it provides a means for learners to do something with the information and away, it allows learners to move the information into the future. I'm going to 
to share with you a lesson plan that can be used in many settings with parents of young children. You should have copies of the lesson as well as additional handouts that are listed on the first page of the lesson. Let's go through the lesson together, just like we were a group of parents. However, unlike a real group of parents, you have the advantage of having the lesson plan in front of you. If you open up to the third page, you can look with me at the introduction. You're going to begin with a welcome and an introduction to the topic of the class using this poster. Point to this large laminated poster of a family meal and ask, what does this look like to you? Well, the kinds of responses you might get would be, looks like a family, they're having a meal, they're at a table, they seem to be enjoying themselves. Everyone's happy and getting along. Then you can say after they've brought those points up, well, today we're going to talk about mealtime. We'll think about how our family eats meals. We'll share what we find most difficult about mealtime. We'll talk about the benefits of family meals, and we'll think about ways we can make our family's meals more like we would like them to be. Section C in your lesson plan is optional, and it's most appropriate in settings where you will be assessing mealtime practices and measuring changes in frequency and quality of family meals. However, if you have the time to do it, it does acknowledge in a non-judgmental way that children eat in many ways, and it might open up parents to talking about what really goes on in their households. So you could use this poster to ask the question, which of these pictures is a family meal? could point out that any of the ones where parents and children are together will qualify. Then you can explain, all parents have struggles sometime with mealtime. Let's introduce ourselves and share the biggest obstacle we face at mealtimes. So then you begin by telling your name and an obstacle you currently face, one you faced in the past, or if you don't have children, one from your family that you, as you were growing up. Invite participants to say their name and one obstacle that they face going around the room. Don't discuss solutions at that point. Simply acknowledge that the obstacles they face are ones that others struggle with. If you want to do this in a group right now, you're welcome to pause the tape and try it out for yourselves. Now you're going to pass out copies of the Let's Talk About Mealtime brochure, and it's available in both English and Spanish. And then you can follow along in the body section of the lesson plan. I think we can all agree that this picture isn't always the way family meals look like. You might be wondering, do family meals have to be with everyone in the family present? Do they have to be at home? Do they have to be at a table? So you bring up that question, and then to answer those questions, look with me at what is written under the picture then you can either read the definition or invite some, one of the participants at your group to read it out loud. And we read that a little bit earlier. So then you can ask them, do they agree with what is written in bold on the cover? Meal time can be your family's time for sharing good food, laughter, and love. Put up the poster like this slide or one of the other versions that is available for downloading that has pictures of a Hispanic family or an African American family. And ask the group to keep their brochures closed. And then ask, have you heard about any of the benefits of eating family meals? And as the participants suggest benefits, you can write them on the large laminated poster using a washable marker. We're going to watch a small portion of a WIC class where the participants are suggesting benefits <laughs> of family meals. Spending time, quality time. We'll write that up here. That's something else. I'm sure you guys have. We prepare food together. Sometimes we don't do the salad. Okay. So we kind of do different things. Involving everyone? Yeah. Hello. Um, I think there's room for everyone in the back. Can you just want to sit back there? Let me. Then you invite the participants to open their brochures and look over this list of benefits. And you can say, sharing meals builds stronger, healthier families in many ways. Did we think of all the benefits that are listed? 
And so they can compare what's written on the poster, and then you can discuss any that they're interested in. And there's discussion questions listed in the study guide. Are there any benefits you hadn't thought of before? Do any of them surprise you? Do you doubt any of them? And what do they mean to you? Then ask them to consider the questions on the front of the brochure. Would they like their family's meals to be easier, more often, or pleasant? Invite them to think about the struggles that they shared at the beginning of the class or others that they may have thought about. How would they like their family's meals to be different? Well, then on the right side of the brochure, they're going to set a goal to make their family meals work better. They're going to choose one goal to start with this week from the left-hand column and an idea to try from the list to the right of their goal. They're going to write their goal and their idea on the back of the brochure in the spaces that are provided. And then once they meet that goal, they can pick a new one. And inside the lesson plan are talking, talking points. And this shows where they write their goals. Then you've got another handout that you can pass out entitled Family Meal Calendar. You can explain that this can be filled out partially or completely depending on what their goals are. If they want to plan breakfasts and lunches in, a, in addition to supper, you can give them more copies. And these can all be downloaded at our website. So if the goal is to find time for family meals and they can only do it three times in a week, then you fill in the columns for those three days, listing who's going to be there, where you're going to eat together, and when you can eat together. I encourage them to think about ways other people in their families can help get the meal ready and list other time-saving ideas, like they're going to use the crock pot and get the meal ready before they go to work that morning. The back side of the handout can help them plan their menu. It has a guideline called Design a Dinner that suggests a healthy meal looks like about half fruits and vegetables, about a quarter breads, rice, or pasta, and about a fourth the protein food like lean meats or legumes. And then once they have their family's meals planned, they can use the left side to make a grocery list. So they have all the foods they need on hand. There's other handouts that you can provide. You can point out where they can obtain more resources. And a great idea is to demonstrate an easy family meal or provide samples to taste and recipes, of course. You can also look at the conclusion in your lesson plan. You want to recap what you talked about, allowing parents to reflect as much as time allows. Having parents say out loud what their goals are is very powerful and will make it more likely they will actually do it. So go around the room again and have each participant share their mealtime goal. Provide encouragement. Let's watch the WIP class participants do this. I want you to notice how many of the goals are listed. Find a place to eat. OK, great. Find a whole place to get some chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, if I couldn't get those right away, then I mean, just basically make sure the TV is turned off while we're eating. That's great. Kind of yeah. And um, have the kids help, help prepare the meal mm -hmm. or get it ready, put it into bowls. Or right. Whatever. Take some of the pressure off of you, right? Yeah, like that. Yeah. And, uh, they even have them help clean up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely <laughs> have them help clean up. Yeah, a little <laughs> age. A little age. They take some more fun things. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Once they get older, they don't like doing it. Anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that sounds like some great goals. Do you think you'll be able to do some of those? Yeah. Good. Step by step one. Good. Okay. What did you? Um, I picked um, also to turn the TV off during meal time, right. just because my son likes to. He loves TV, and oh, he yeah. will just get up during. We'll be sitting at the table, but he'll just like to get up and watch, and then come really? back in and uh -huh. do that. So it's a big distraction. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, really? Yeah. And once you get into the habit, it's really hard to break. So that be now when they're, you know, hopefully somebody young should help out. So that, that's a good goal. Do you think you'll be able to enforce yeah. it? <laughs> that's good. What did you choose? Focus on family, not TV. Yep, see? That seems to be the number one, right? Start turning the TV off during dinner time. Okay, that's that's see that's another good thing. You know, get everyone kind of you know this is family meal time. We're going to be eating soon. Let's get ready. So turning it off ahead of time is a very good idea. Which one did you choose? Oh, I didn't choose that one. <laughs> I chose <laughs> one easy, healthy, and tasty meals. Okay. Um, I want to start eating healthier. Okay. What we do and shopping and picking out 
new LBNs that we haven't had before than finding a recipe for them. Okay, that's a great idea. And actually, in a couple minutes, we'll talk about that. So um, that's a very good goal. And it sounds like Caden likes carrots, so maybe he can play those. <laughs> good. Yeah. Okay, what did you choose? I just picked the find the time. Find the time, it's really difficult. Yeah. Make supper night before. Right, and actually in just a couple minutes, you're getting a little ahead of me. We're going to talk about how you can do that. So um, that's an excellent, it's very difficult for people to find time. I know it can be hard. Which one did you choose? Enjoy that time together. Okay. And I'll make family time more fun and social. Looking forward to birthdays and weekends. Oh, yeah, that, see, that sounds good. And it sounds like you've already got your family involved, so maybe take it to the next step. Whoops, find a place. <laughs> Sorry about that. I wanted it to replay. You can end your class by pointing out the family meal slogan at the top of the poster, and it's also on the back of the brochure. Make meal time, family time. Where else can you fit in a discussion of family meals in group sessions? Sessions about picky eaters or about parent-child roles in feeding and eating are ideal times to discuss the importance of eating with your children. Without family meals, it is very important to fill these roles. This would be a good time to use that icebreaker, having the parents share their feelings or descriptions of how their children eat or their biggest frustrations with feeding children. Meal planning sessions are perfect times to bring up the concept of family meals. Who else are they likely to be planning for? Have the parents share ways that they plan ahead. Some may write down menu ideas. Others may have strategies for well-stocked kitchens. Some may do some advanced preparations like cooking once for more than one meal and freezing the extra. Sessions about shopping for food can mention the importance of family meals. Talk about the ways grocery stores provide foods for quick and easy family meals. Food demonstrations and cooking classes are perfect times to bring up how the entire family can be involved in cooking and serving and cleaning up. While you're dicing and mixing and sharing alternatives to ingredients, you can also discuss how important family meals are, as well as how to make them a reality. Have parents share how their children or partners help with meals. Have them share their favorite ways to fix the foods you are making in your class and other favorites for family meals. Use the questions and ideas in the handout and the lesson plan for possible ways you can include this concept in other classes. At farmers markets, health fairs, and other locations where you meet with parents individually or in small groups, you can bring up this topic in conversation. An opening question like, what is your family's favorite meal, or what is your family's favorite way to eat zucchini, can lead to a discussion about mealtime at their house. If you'd like to explore the topic further, give them a handout. If you have time, interact with them about their family's meals and what goals they might have. Parenting classes of any kind can address issues such as the importance of family routines and traditions, and how to encourage a positive mealtime environment. Whatever the setting, our ultimate goal is to empower parents to make mealtime family time, to help them make their families' meals healthier, happier, and happen more often. Our goal is not to just tell them a bunch of warm, fuzzy stuff about eating with their families, but to help them make their families' meals better. We are in the behavior change business, not simply the information transfer business. Our sixth and final segment will help us change behaviors.
Our last segment is going to wrap up our series with a look at how to help parents set goals based on stages of change, as well as how to measure behavior change. The bottom line in nutrition education is not whether someone got smarter, but whether someone took action. We are in the behavior change business. Let me repeat that from the last segment. If what we do doesn't lead people to live differently, we've just wasted our time and their time by simply telling them stuff. Remember our overall goal, empowering parents to make mealtime family time. That's taking action. Maybe at the present time, the parent rarely or never eats with the child. The child might eat breakfast in the car on the way to the sitter or daycare. Lunches are eaten in that setting, and when they get home, mom makes the child supper and serves it to the child while they eat alone watching TV. This may be a single mom who is exhausted after a long day of work, and the child is hungry and cranky and they don't want to wait for a meal with mom. Maybe some nights they pick up a meal at a fast food drive through and the child eats in the car again at the end of the day. You might think, well, weekends are a time to make up for this. But what if this child spends their weekends with their dad, who lives with the grandparents? Today's reality may not be that conducive to our desired outcome of having family meals at least sometimes. Is behavior change possible? How could we facilitate it? How do we determine if this parent is ready to make a change? Another tool for your counseling toolkit is to assess readiness to change. Many of you are familiar with the stages of change theory, which tells us that when it comes to behavior change, people will be at various stages of readiness to change, ranging from not even considering it to already doing it. You may be familiar with the terms pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. Someone in the pre-contemplation stage isn't even thinking about it. They may not even be aware of the problem. Contemplation acknowledges that there is a problem, but they are not ready or sure of wanting to change. Preparation is the stage when someone is ready to make a change. Action is the stage when they are changing behavior, but it isn't a stable behavior yet. They've been doing it for less than six months. Maintenance is when the behavior is a part of their life. Someone can enter or exit at any point in the cycle, so there's no guarantee that someone will make it to maintenance or even stay there forever. By assessing readiness to change, you can tailor your approach to the client's readiness rather than give everyone the same canned advice. Since words like pre-contemplation aren't really everyday words, the stages can be simplified down to three categories of readiness called not ready, unsure, and ready. Ready encompasses everything from preparation to maintenance. If a person is ready, then we'll dig deeper to determine their level of readiness. Use a question like this in a 10-point scale to assess whether they are ready or not. Most people are able to assign a number when asked a question like this. If you want a visual tool for this scale of 1 to 10, you could make a readiness ruler with the numbers 1 to 10 marked off and have them make an X where they are or point to it. Let's imagine how this might look. Let's say the family you are working with does not have structured meals and much of the difficulty the parent is having with feeding seems to be related to this lack of structure. So your conversation might go something like this. Melissa, you've expressed frustration over getting Micah to sit down and eat, with what, eat what you've prepared. You mentioned that he seems to eat better when you get together with your mother and eat as a family at her house. Yeah, there's something about Grandma's house. I'm not sure. Well, we've talked about how eating meals together as part of your daily routine might help Micah eat better at home, too. On a scale of 1 to 10, how ready are you to try eating supper together at home sometime this week? Maybe a 3. Things are just really crazy right now. I, I'm just not sure if I could do it. Okay. Thank you. So if the mother indicates 
like Melissa did, that she is not ready. Our role is not to push change on her. You might be really tempted to. She may not think a change is needed, or she may know that a change would be beneficial, but is unwilling, or probably as Melissa uh, seemed to express, feels unable to change. And each of these merit a little different approach. To move her through the changes of stages of change, she first needs to become more aware of her need to adopt this new behavior and must perceive a strong personal benefit. She needs to believe that the new behavior is worth the perceived cost of change because what she is doing now is comfortable and familiar, even if it's negative. You must acknowledge the barriers she believes that are preventing this behavior change and then encourage her to think about what would be gained to motivate her to begin considering ways to overcome her barriers. All of this needs to take place in a non-judgmental environment. You must be perceived as being on her side and advocating in the best interest of her family. It isn't until she moves into the unsure category that she is ready for you to probe deeper for perceived pros and cons to change. You can plan to follow up with this at her next visit. Encourage her to observe what is going on and consider how things are working now and how she might like them to be different. At the follow-up, you might learn that mom is satisfied with things the way they are, or at least she tells you this. To determine this, ask her how she might like things to be different and what is getting in the way. When the client moves into the unsure category, this is the time you can problem solve ways to overcome the barriers to change. When the client gives you a response of seven or eight up to 10, it indicates they are more than likely ready to make changes, at least some small steps toward change. If the parent is just barely ready, that seven, maybe that eight, she needs some simple and likely to succeed ideas that are presented as something to try out for a few days to see how they work. You can even phrase it as trying an experiment. This concept of a trial or an experiment encourages not only making the attempt, but also evaluating how it went. If the experiment is successful, it reinforces the behavior. If it isn't successful, encourage her to simply modify her approach and try another experiment rather than feel like, oh, it's a failure. Sometimes the client will act ready to make big changes, possibly even unrealistic changes. Help them set realistic goals and create an action plan that is reasonable and measurable. Unrealistic goals are likely to fail. I'm going to eat every meal every day this week with my child. Well, unless they're already doing it 20 times a week out of 21, it's unlikely to happen. If when they do fail, help them use those experiences as opportunities to learn what doesn't work and to try out a new strategy. A perceived failure can cause someone to relapse into a previous stage of change. Now let's get out your Let's Talk About Mealtime handout and turn to the inside right panel. Let's look at these examples of tailoring our suggestions for taking action to a person's readiness. The four ideas that are listed to try with each goal are designed to match the client's readiness to change. The first idea is for the person who is either not ready or unsure if they are ready to change. At best, they are just beginning to contemplate making this change. They basically need to think more about the possibility of changing. On the list of action steps, the first one always starts with the word think. Think about when your family could eat together this week. Think of where you can eat meals together. Think of a meal your family likes. The second idea is for the person who is ready but needs a very small step. These are people in the preparation stage. You know they are in the stage because they want to change, but they haven't yet tried or have just tried for a short time in a very limited way. Each of the items listed under number two has them do something that prepares them to change. 
such as getting a place ready to eat together, or making a shopping list, or learning about parent and child roles to avoid mealtime battles. They aren't actually doing the behavior fully, but they are planning ahead and getting ready to do it. The third idea is for the person who is in the action stage. They have gotten started, but they haven't reached their desired goal, and they need help to achieve more. These are very concrete ideas, such as eat together X times this week, or get your family to help with shopping, cooking, and cleanup, or try conversation starters. The fourth idea is for the person who has been having family meals fairly successfully, but they'd like to take it to the next level. The ideas listed under number four include either doing something more often, such as turn off the TV during meals five times this week, or doing something in a new way, such as have a special theme meal, or try a new location for a meal this week. By matching our approach to the degree to which the parent is ready to take action, we will be empowering parents to achieve their individual goals for their family's meals. We need to demonstrate how well we are able to make this happen. Evaluating our effectiveness requires us to collect some data, both before and after we provide an intervention. If you are watching this training series, it is likely that you are part of a program that is participating in some type of evaluation or research to measure how much people are able to change these behaviors and what leads to behavior change. The overall assessment process is simple. An initial assessment is completed before receiving an intervention. An intervention can include something as simple as receiving a brochure or being involved in counseling or participating in a discussion group. The type of intervention provided needs to be documented to determine what works best to bring about change. After the participant has had time to implement changes, a follow-up assessment is done to measure behavior change. If a more controlled study design is being used, a group of people will receive the pretest and post-test without an intervention in order to control for these outside variables. To be fair, they will receive the intervention after the post-test. For the Indiana SNAP project, the assessment tool is going to be three questions on one page, and you will receive instructions for when and how to use it. It is so important that we document our effectiveness and add to the evidence of how family meals benefit families and how they can be effectively promoted and achieved. This brings us to the end of our video series. We now know that family meals have multiple benefits to children and families. We have learned some teachable moments when the topic of mealtime will address a concern that a parent has or help them reach a dream. We've learned that parents want family meals that are easier, more often, and more pleasant. We've learned that talking with parents about mealtime involves engaging them in a conversation that is warm and open, personal, and empowering. We've learned some effective strategies for counseling, group dialogues, and promoting behavior change that are all focused on the participant. I hope you feel motivated to put what you've learned into practice as soon as possible. To set your course, you've been writing down action steps to get started. If you've been following the directions in your study guide, don't put it on the shelf. Put it on the family table and empower the parents in your program to make mealtime family time.